Praise the Lord. 
That song may not exactly resonate with you because you may not feel really victorious this morning. Things in your life may pretty stink pretty much right now, all right? But we have a God who will not give up on you. He didn't give up on me. He won't give up on you. We have a God who, who can make what looks like defeat turn into an awesome victory, so it's going to be Okay. And that's who we're here to praise this morning. Hey, I'm so glad you're here. If you're a guest, thanks for coming out to be with us at Twickenham. If you're looking for a church home, man, we're looking for new family members. So already we have something in common. That's awesome. There is a, a, a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and indicate any requests that you may have for us about information or more conversation. And you can indicate prayer requests on there, and we will be praying about those as early as this afternoon. So if you want to go ahead and start filling those out, we can pick those up when we take our offering in just a few minutes. Mike Wearley is going to lead us in a communion thought a little bit later on. We're glad to have Lincoln back from being out of town. Welcome back, Lincoln. Glad you're here. And uh, really grateful for our praise team. They always do a great job in leading us in worship to the Lord. Hey, I want to welcome a couple of new families. Uh, Jeff and Jan Brewer have uh, been with us now for several weeks. Why don't you guys stand up so we give them a hand. Welcome them. Glad they're here. <laughs> Stacy and Melanie Balch and their girls, uh, Gabby and Reagan. Can you guys all stand? They're all kind of right around in here. Welcome. And then... Chelsea Thomason on the board in the back in the lot in the in the uh, balcony. Good hand to Chelsea. Glad to have you guys. Welcome, welcome, new folks. Now the newest member of our church is 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 like brand new. He's brand new to the world, and we want to introduce him to you right now. Uh, Adam and Christy Barney are here, and uh, Todd, if you can come on up, and um, their first son Graham in Adam's arms, and then their newest, Oliver, who was welcomed into their family just this past week. What an awesome moment. I'm going to get out of the way here, and you guys kind of get in the middle. And uh, he's awake, so you can give him a big hand. It's all right. Just give him a hand. And this is, this is Oliver right there. So Todd, we have, we have a gift, uh, gift for you. This is a spoon that we give that, it, I don't know what's on it, probably Oliver. So... <laughs> But uh, Todd, Todd White said one of our elders is going to lead us in a prayer for this new child. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you uh, this morning for the gift of children, and the gift of family, and for the grace and mercy you extend to us. We thank you for Oliver this morning. Uh, he is an answered prayer, uh, yet another. And so we lift him up to you and commit him to you, and we thank you, Father, for the blessing of his life. Pray that you would uh, bless Adam and Christy as they, as they lead their family and as they watch over these, these sweet children. Pray that you would bless Oliver as he grows up, that you bless Graham as his brother, and that you would, Father, build this family in your grace and your mercy. Our prayer is that they would come to know you, that they would come to love you, and that they would come to walk with you. And so we ask that you bless them and you bless us as a church family as we surround them. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Let's stand again and hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. And may we shout for joy over your victory and lift our, up our banners in the name of our God. Let's praise the Lord this morning. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. And we continue in Psalm 20. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. The Lord give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. Let's take our offering. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say. Yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone, never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God. Mount 
mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Be seated. Communion. Good morning. Before communion this morning, I'll be reading Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us pray. Father, we gather around this table with these witnesses and we remember Jesus, enduring to the point of having his body broken on the cross. Amen.
offer thanks for the cup. Father, we remember Jesus on the cross, his blood poured out for us. Father, we even now are reminded of the joy set before us. And Father, we praise you for the grace that makes that possible. In his name we pray, amen. Hast thou not been me seek thy face, and shall I seek in vain the spring year of sovereign grace? Be death when I complain, no still. Let my soul 
quick program note uh, before we get started here this morning. If you haven't signed up for a small group yet, I really wish you would do that. We have some uh, information in uh, all of the lobbies about our small groups. Uh, on Sunday mornings, this is kind of the path that we, we feel like it would be good for you to take. You, you can be involved in a journey group. That's one of our Sunday morning Sunday school classes. And then on, on Sunday nights, typically, but some groups do it differently, uh, a smaller group of folks, uh, you know, sometimes it's uh, three or four couples, sometimes it's eight or ten, meet in a home, and they spend time together, they study together, they bond together. And then, of course, getting involved in some ministry is uh, uh, another step, and then being here together in worship. But I, I, I've known a lot of people who have grown spiritually, but I don't know many, if any, people who have grown spiritually deeper in the Lord unless they were involved with other brothers and sisters. In fact, I can't, I can't think of anybody who has ever grown unless they were connected deeply with other folks. Journey groups and small groups especially are a great way for you to do that. Steve Krieger is sitting right over here. Steve, can you wave your hand if you need information? Steve can tell you more about that. I just really want to encourage that. I want to challenge you on that. I, just, I really want to urge you to do it. Be, it would be good for you. You need it. I need it. We need it. Okay? We are beginning a new series uh, this morning from the book of Daniel. It's called Even If. And uh, the title comes from a moment uh, in the story of Daniel where three young Jewish men are threatened with death by fire if they do not bow down to a nine-story idol, solid gold idol, built on the orders of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. And their response to the king is, is respectful, but it's defiant. Now, this is from uh, Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. They, they say, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. All right, now here, here's the significance of the title. But 
even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Even if he does not, I will stand, I will be faithful, I will be strong. Now, we'll, we'll get to that story and explore it in much more detail in a couple of weeks, but I wanted to make sure you caught the significance of the series title. We're going to be talking about the kind of commitment and the kind of courage it takes to do things God's way, even if it means tremendous sacrifice and loss or even death. Uh, this, would be a, uh, this would be a great series for, for you guys. Actually, we planned this for the start of school. Got to get delayed a little bit for two or three different reasons. Irma, Harvey, people like that. Uh, but it'd be a great thing for you guys to bring friends to. And it's going to be good for all of us to engage with this story. It'll help to know a little bit about the book of Daniel. Uh, it is neatly, the book itself, if you want to go to the, if you want to kind of open your Bible to the middle and then... Um, Go to the right, left, turn toward the end, you'll, you'll run into Daniel in a few hundred pages. Um, the, the book is neatly divided into two equal sections. Chapters 1 through 6 are what we call historical narrative. By historical, we mean that these events are a part of history. They happened in a particular place and a particular time, and we'll unpack that, a little bit of that history in, in a couple of minutes. And by narrative, we simply mean that they're arranged in the form of a story, which is one of the things that makes the first six chapters of Daniel so very interesting. It's just a great story or a series of stories. And then chapters 7 through 12, the last half of the book, are a type of literature called prophetic vision. Prophetic vision. They're Daniel's account of a series of visions he received from God that predicted the future. And I will tell you that Daniel, ch Daniel chapters 7 through 12 are the happy hunting ground for religious kookery and conspiracy theorists the world over. All right? And for this series, we're only going to look at the first six chapters, uh, the historical narrative section. And we'll get to the last half of Daniel another time when you have a different preacher. I, I, <laughs> I don't want to take all the good stuff, all right? I got to leave some of the good stuff for people who come behind me. So let's talk about the historical setting. The story takes place around 600 years before Jesus. And uh, you've got great prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel who were active leading up to and, and during some of this period. The story takes place in uh, a city called Babylon. Um, which was located in what is now modern-day Iraq. The ruins of the city of Babylon are about 60 miles southwest of Baghdad. Babylon's cultural and educational impact was nearly unrivaled in the ancient world. In fact, Australian researchers recently translated a stone tablet inscribed with a table of numbers that was more advanced in some ways than modern trigonometry, which means the Babylonians were using trigonometry a thousand years before the Greeks, who everybody thought were the first to develop that higher form of math. In fact, some people are beginning to think that Pythagoras, you've heard of the Pythagorean theory, right? They, they think that he may have borrowed that from the Babylonians. Another group of researchers out of London discovered that Babylonian priests used an early form of integral calculus to track the orbit of Jupiter. Babylon sounds like an old, irrelevant place in a country far, far away, but there were as many pocket protectors in Babylon as there are in Huntsville. <laughs> we are alike. It was the rising superpower and the main geopolitical rival to Assyria and Egypt. In fact, under Nebuchadnezzar, at the Battle of Carchemish, Babylonia erased Assyria and forced the Egyptian pharaoh Necho to retreat back to where he came from. And that's where we pick up uh, the story told in Daniel. Against the advice of the prophet Jeremiah, the Jewish king Jehoiakim allied himself with Egypt. He picked the wrong team. 
And then when the Babylonians defeated Egypt in a later battle, they laid siege to Jerusalem. And the story of Daniel begins with the end of his country and the end of his freedom. Now, I've asked a couple of my friends to come up here and join me, um, Madison Flynn and Stephen Krieger. I'm going to ask them to, to read all of Daniel 1 for us. It's a, kind of a long reading, but it's good for us to hear big chunks of Scripture together, and it's good for them to share it with you. So give them a, a listen, I think. Madison, are you in first? Is that right? Okay. Take off, guys. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and testified tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice of food and, want, and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Thank you, guys. Give him a hand. That was great. I think, uh, I think Ashley and Caleb... Uh, secured their uh, participation before they actually read the text and saw all those names they had to learn how to pronounce. So, great job, guys. I want to uh, begin by focusing on the four main human characters in the story, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They, along with no telling how many others, had been captured and carried 700 miles from their home in Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 4 tells us that they were young, they were intelligent, uh, they were quick to learn, and they were good looking, which is a, a common tactic among ancient rulers. The, you, you take the most promising young people from the nation that you just conquered, the best and the brightest, and, and you, you take them out of their home environment so they'll no longer be an influence there. You bring them to your country and then you put them through a program of re-education to make them loyal to your regime. I want you to notice four things that happened to these young people. First, in verse 4, it says that they were to be trained in the language and literature of the Babylonians. In other words, they were going to learn to think and speak in a different language, and they were going to learn to live by different stories. Change the way people think, 
change the stories they live by, and you change the people. For three years, they were going to be indoctrinated in all things Babylonian. For three years, they were going to be told that your ancestors, your relatives, are a bunch of ignorant, lowborn, unsophisticated, good for nothing apple knockers. They're just not, you want a real learning, you want real education, you want real sophistication. Let us tell you these Babylonian stories. There's a lot going on in our culture right now, and, and there's, there's racial tension, and there's political tension, there's all of this tension, but a part of that, a big part of all of that is, called, is what I would call narrative tension. Who gets to tell the story? Who gets to tell the story of our past? That's where a lot of that tension is coming from. And Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians knew that whoever gets to tell the story gets to shape the future. And so they're changing the stories of these young people. Second in verse 5, it says that they were also given a different diet. The amount of food they were to eat and the kind of food they were to eat was going to be regulated by somebody else. And we kind of don't think that's that big a deal, right? Okay. And it's probably really, really good food. Much better if it was the king's food. But don't discount the significance of a change in diet. When I was recruiting doctors, very many of the candidates I worked with were from India. And one of the questions I learned to anticipate and answer was this, are there any Indian groceries in the town where this job is? And if there were, I stood a good chance of placing that doctor in that town. If there were not, in all likelihood, he or she would keep looking. The body and the mind are more connected than we imagine. New language, new stories, new diet. Like I said last week, uh, these guys are sort of, sort of like you. They, they were made to go to class and they had to eat in the lunchroom. It's kind of yucky. That's not all. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were given new names too. Each of their Hebrew names contained some reference to God. Daniel's name means God is my judge. Uh, Hananiah's name means God is gracious. Mishael's name is a rhetorical question. Who is like God? And then Azariah's name means God helps. Their new names were Belteshazzar or Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And each of those names is a reference to to one of the Babylonian gods, Bel, Aku, or Nebo. New language, new story, new diets, new names. One more thing. It's not certain, but it's possible they even lost their gender. Verse 3 says that a man named Ashpenaz was the chief of Nebuchadnezzar's court officials. He was in charge of the exiles. The, the New International Version kind of softens that up a little bit. Ashpenaz was actually the chief of the eunuchs. Again, it was not uncommon for ancient rulers to castrate the males who served in the court of the king. And we think gender issues are a new thing. 600 years before Jesus. You see what's happening to these young people. They're, they're being held captive in a Babylonian re-education camp. They are being systematically deconstructed, broken down, brainwashed, and rebuilt to live as good Babylonians. Their identities as the people of God were being erased and replaced. That's not, it's not a difficult interpretive move for us to see the parallels in our own situation. In a thousand different ways, our culture pressures us to conform to its values, embrace its priorities, obey its rules, promote its customs, speak its language, love its passions, live its stories. It happens very slowly, it happens very subtly, but our culture, especially the thought leaders and storytellers, are influencing our language, instilling their stories, altering our identities, and shaping our ways of thinking. Now, I'm not so much a conspiracy theorist to say that all of it is deliberate, some grand evil scheme. I'm certain some of it is, but not all of it is. But even if, if most of the influence in our culture is incidental, the point remains 
that our environment changes us. Our culture tells us what is and is not a sin, or even if there is such a thing. It sets the boundaries between right and wrong, and those boundaries, like the definitions of sin, shift depending on which ideologies gain the most traction in any given season. Our culture tells us who our heroes and villains should be, and those too change, depending on who gets to tell the stories of the past. We call the movies, the music, and the television shows that we watch and listen to entertainment, and they do entertain, but there is always an agenda, sometimes subtle, sometimes overt, sometimes inadvertent, but always there. And to be perfectly honest, sometimes, in fact, perhaps even often, the programming of our culture is entirely consistent with the values of God. The idea that bigotry and racism and hatred are terrible sins, which is a culturally held value now, is entirely consistent with the Word of God, and we should celebrate. There is much to celebrate and embrace about our culture. But even with a cursory, cursory semi-critical look, it's not hard to see where our culture parts company with Scripture and seeks to turn you and me, and you guys especially, too, into good Babylonians. Daniel helps us deal with that, that aspect of our culture, by answering two critical questions. The first one is this. How do you, how do you live faithfully in exile? Remember, Daniel and his friends have been taken from Jerusalem, marched 700 miles to a different country where they don't speak the language, they don't know the stories, they don't share the customs, they don't even eat the same kind of food, and they have to live in that environment faithful to God. How do you do that? Our exile may not be as dramatic, but if you're really serious about living God's way, it will be very, very different than the cultural way. So how do you live faithfully in exile? That question will be answered all through the first six chapters, but here, here's how it's answered in the story you heard, the, read just a moment ago. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Now there's all kind of commentary uh, about why Daniel and his three friends declined to eat the food provided by the king. Maybe it was Maybe it was not kosher. Maybe it was been sacrificed to idols. So nobody really knows. And to be honest, it really doesn't matter. What's important is that in some way, eating the king's food would have been a compromise. A, a small one, maybe. But one that Daniel and his friends did not want to make. And I'm impressed with their resolve. They weren't willing to even compromise in a small way. And that kind of resolve is impressive, but I'm even more impressed with how they did it. First, Daniel asked for permission. Can we choose a different meal plan? And the food services manager was sympathetic, but a coward. And he said, the king will have my head on a platter because you'll, you'll look awful. So, no, I'm sorry. And then Daniel turned to the, to the assistant manager, and he used the magic word, verse 12, please. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink, and compare our appearance to that of the young men who eat the royal food, and then treat, treat us in accordance with what you see. And so the assistant service manager agreed and tested them for 10 days. You know what I love about that? Daniel didn't go on a hunger strike. He didn't put a sign on a stick and, and mount a protest in front of the Babylonian high school lunchroom. He didn't slap a smart mouth bumper sticker on his chariot. He and his friends very quietly, very humbly stood for their principles. Is it possible that sometimes people refuse to listen to what we have to say or refuse to respect our beliefs, not because what we have to say is so onerous, or because they don't respect us, but because we go about our business in kind of a jerky way. 
I know there is a time for people in exile to go to DEFCON 4, and that time will come for Daniel and his friends, but there is wisdom in a more winsome approach, in a more joyful approach, in a more humble approach. The answer to the question, how do you live faithfully in exile? You refuse to compromise, even in the little things, and don't be a jerk about it. But there's an even more important question answered in the book of Daniel. The first one is focused on how you and I behave in exile. No compromise. The second question is focused on what we believe, and that's more important. Because how we behave is determined by what we believe. So here's the second question. Who's in charge here? Who's in charge? When you look at the story, and if you were living it, if you were living in that historical moment, it would look like Nebuchadnezzar was in charge, like he was controlling all of the action. He had just defeated the Assyrian army. He had driven Pharaoh back to Egypt. He had besieged Jerusalem, carried off its best and brightest young leaders. He's instituted a heartless plan to erase their identities, memories, language, culture, and religion. But is the king with the long name really running the show? Look again at how the story begins. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these Nebuchadnezzar carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put, and put it in the treasury of his God. T taking articles from the temple of God in Jerusalem and putting them in the temple of his God in Babylon was sort of like hanging a, a, a 10 point buck or a 10 pound bass on your living room wall. It was, they were trophies. It was Nebuchadnezzar's way of saying, my God's bigger than your God. But did he really take those treasures? Verse two, and the Lord delivered. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And the Lord delivered. Who's in charge? God delivered Jehoiakim. We, we would have been blown away if we had been living in that time because we were, we were God's people. This was God's nation. Judah was the home of God's house. And God wasn't near as patriotic about Judah and Israel as Judah and Israel were. God was more concerned about his purposes and his goals and his mission than he was any national identity. You know, it would be good for us as Americans to embrace that and realize that? That if Judah and Israel did not enjoy most favored nation status with God, then neither will the United States of America. I love this country. I am not on board with people who say that everything about this country is bad and that all the problems in the world are our fault. We've liberated far more people than we've ever oppressed. We've done more good in the world than, than evil. Not that we've always done good. We have done some terrible things. But the world would be a worse place without us. But God doesn't have a bank of American flags behind his throne. God loves the United States of America, and he loves Russia, and he loves Iraq, and he loves Iran, and he loves North Korea, and he loves Cuba, and he loves all the rest of them. God loves everybody. And God is more interested in his mission than any national identity anywhere, including ours. That's kind of a hard thing to hear, but that's absolutely scripture. That's the truth. And it gets to the point of that question, who is in charge? The Lord delivered, the Bible says. If God delivered Jerusalem and its king and its temple into the hands of the king with the long name, 
then it sounds an awful lot like God willingly embraced defeat. Let me say that again. It looks like God willingly embraced defeat. Kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi in the first Star Wars movie, Episode 4, A New Hope. He lets Darth Vader win. If you, if you, he said, if you strike me down, I will become more po- powerful than you can possibly imagine. He willingly embraced defeat, or like Loki in the Avengers when he lets himself be captured. His brother, Thor, tries to reassure everybody, Loki's a prisoner here, and Nick Fury goes, then why do I feel like he's the only one who really wants to be on this boat? And for you gamers... The same thing happens in in one quest in World of Warfare. You let yourself be captured to get closer to the enemy leader. This idea of willingly embrace defeat sounds really familiar. Not because it's a common trope in movies, literature, and gaming, but because it's precisely what God has always done. It's exactly what Jesus did on the cross. The cross was not an unexpected outcome that God had to somehow overcome. It was the plan from the beginning. And though it looked like a tragic defeat, it was a defining triumph. The Jewish and Roman enemies of Jesus thought that by striking him down, they could kill his cause. In defeat, he became more powerful than they could ever imagine. Knowing the answer to the question, who's in charge, changes everything. Because even when all the evidence seems to suggest otherwise, when it feels like you're living behind enemy lines spiritually, when standing by your principles and refusing to compromise seems an awfully expensive price to pay, if you believe that God is in charge, you can live with courage. You can live with conviction. And you can refuse to compromise. Because even in defeat, God wins. God wins. Let's stand together and pray, and then we're going to sing. God, sometimes it feels like we are so far behind enemy lines, like everybody around us speaks a different language, cares about different things, lives by different stories, has different priorities. Sometimes it feels like we don't belong. And then sometimes, Father, it feels like there's no difference between us and the language that we speak and the priorities that we embrace and the values that we embody. So sometimes we're scared to death and sometimes we're ashamed. So we we come to you this morning thanking you for this awesome story of these young people who were able to stand up, no compromise, trust in you, who who had the kind of faith that said, even if our God doesn't deliver, we will stand strong. God, we want that kind of faith. We want our young people to have that kind of faith. We want our parents, our grandparents, everybody in the room. We, we, in in our hearts, we want to be those kind of people. And so we confess to you that we often are not. And we invite you into our lives May your spirit come into our lives in a powerful way so that we will know who is in charge and therefore we can be strong. We can stand. We know you will deliver. You may not always deliver on our timetable or in the way we want you to, but you are a God who delivers and we praise you for that. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise Him, you heavens and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels in heavenly host. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let the whole earth praise Him. Great in power, great in glory, great in mercy, King of heaven, great in battle, great in wonder.
clouds above. Praise Him, you angels in heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining star. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and sky. Let the whole earth praise Him. Great in power, great in glory, great in mercy, King of heaven, great to be back with you from God's country, the great state of Texas, where it is always bigger and better, and this year a lot wetter, if you get what I'm saying. Uh, great to be back. Your worship this morning was an inspiration to me, and I know that it was a sweet aroma to our Lord and Savior, so thank you for that. Uh, don't forget these things as we close. Uh, the men's retreat is coming up this weekend. If you're still interested, I think we can still get you in. Those guys have worked really hard to have a great weekend plan, so uh, if you're still out there and want to go, please know that I think that can happen. Also, the 39ers have a trip coming up. There's a baby shower next weekend. It's all in your bulletin. Outback America's coming up. There's a men's trout fishing trip coming up. And especially important, this Saturday is the PAR golf tournament. PAR is our prepare and respond ministry, um, disaster relief, recovery. In fact, they were in... Texas this past week doing uh, just a great mission over there. And I got some pictures. They were in Bayside, Texas. Bayside is a community of 300 people who is yet to be touched by FEMA or Red Cross. We were the only presence in that place. Dave and the team were there. Uh, this is a gentleman whose roof was blown off of his house. His house was flooded. He lives there with his wife who's in bad health. And then there's another lady named Lillian who lives next door. She's in the next one. Uh, her house also was damaged. She's sick. No one there to help her, no one there to respond. Our guys came in, and they worked on both of these places. You can keep going there, Mike. Uh, Leslie Clark's a contractor. They put an entire new roof on one of those homes so that they could have a dry house. Did tree, there's Doug, did a tree removal and debris removal. Uh, cutting that stuff up, getting out of the way, working on the roof. Finished that. And then most importantly, I think, is they say we're here because of what God has done for us and what we believe we are now called to do for others. And so I think it's a great ministry. That's a great message to be right there in the time of need. And we thank you for your generous offering a couple weeks ago, over $20,000 uh, the church gave. They passed out $5,000 in Lowe's and Home Depot gift cards throughout the community. And so it's really important to remember all the work that goes in and to help support it by like being in this golf tournament. So thanks to those guys. Dave's right over here. If you need any more information or want to know about the golf tournament, Dave, raise your hand, Dave. Can't miss him. Thank you guys for what you did. Thank you. And most of all, we're glad you're here if you're a guest. Thank you for being here. And we hoped that the Lord will bless you this week as we close in prayer. Thanks again. My faith was, uh, was challenged at a young age of seven by an atheist that lived across the street. I don't know how you become an atheist at seven years old, but he challenged my faith that day. He asked me a, que a series of questions. You know, he, he asked me, do you believe in God? And I said, yes, I do. Do you believe he's all powerful? I said, yes, I do. He says, well, can he make a rock that he can't pick up? And that, that shook my faith for just a second there. And I guess throughout my life, 
there's always been a, you know, a doubt back there, you know? You read the, the stories that we've talked about today and, and others, um, the parting of the Red Sea, other stories. You could doubt God really do that? And this week, he proved he could do that. If you, if you didn't see it, there's videos of the ocean dry. It's just, there's no ocean there. People walking on where there once was, was no, where there once was water. And God has proven to me this week, he has reaffirmed my faith in him. And will you pray with me as we, as we go to our Lord? Dear God, we are so thankful. Thankful that you prove to us in our unbelief that you will help us with our unbelief. And we're thankful for these signs that you give us. We're just so thankful that we can gather here to get together and praise your name and know that you are God and that you prove yourself each and every day. Be with us this week and help us to proclaim you to others. In Christ's name we pray, amen.